Um, it is so wonderful to, uh, and an honor to welcome all of you to this Woodbury Leadership Workshop. And it's an honor I couldn't imagine having when I was in elementary school and saw the Reverend Dr. Kirk Byron Jones preach for the very first time. But if you've taken a class with Kirk, you know that the spirit is always up to something. So even back then, maybe the spirit was being a little mischievous, planting something in my soul, thanks to Kirk, that I could not deny. So on behalf of Andover Newton Seminary, Yale Divinity School, on behalf of this beloved community where the spirit is indeed up to something, I offer a welcome. My name is Ned Allen Parker. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm an alum, 2010, and I'm now the Associate Dean for Institutional Advancement here at Andover Newton. And one of my responsibilities in this role is what we call knowledge creation and dissemination. Gratefully, it's not my knowledge being disseminated, um, but instead those best practices coming out of the academy and more importantly, coming out of the local church. These are best practices, new insights and thriving ministries that, um, that we want to share with people in the pulpit and people in the pews. Andover Newton's moniker is the school of the church. And our mission holds us accountable to the faith communities that make up the church. So we are working together to share new stirrings of the spirit and new directions in which the spirit is moving. Last March, um, you may have seen that Andover Newton was one of, the, one of the first institutions to curate online resources for ministry in a time of pandemic. This was less about what we were doing and more about the fact that it was Andover Newton alumni, alumni like Matt Krebin, Mindy Welton Mitchell, and others, some of you attending this workshop, who were writing about shifts and changes needing to be made in ministerial practices to navigate COVID-19, which was so new then, um, and we weren't sure what to expect and its impact on communities of faith. Additionally, we want to share important and critical information, including this opportunity to reflect with Kirk about developments that have come since the first printing of Rest in the Storm 20 years ago. So now I would love to briefly introduce my colleagues who will be participating in this program. Andover Newton's founding dean, Sarah Birmingham Drummond, will offer an opening prayer and some history behind this program, the Woodbury Leadership Workshop, and she will also close us with a benediction. Third year MDiv students, Tara Humphreys, will introduce the speaker for this program, the Reverend Dr. Kirk Byron Jones. And following the talk by Kirk, third year MDiv student Don Jefferson will lead us in conversation. So, if you have questions during the program, please um, use the message feature in Zoom to private message Dawn, and she will use these questions to guide our conversation at the end. So with that, welcome one and all, and may the peace of Christ be with you. Sarah, take it away. Thank you, Ned, and thank you so much for gathering us all together. Um, we are really grateful, Ned, that you as an alum yourself are always finding ways to connect us one with another. And I also just really want to point out the fact that Ned always manages to say something in his introduction that makes me feel really old. And I'm just really glad that today that that honor went to Kirk Jones. <laughs> Greetings to all and welcome to the 2021 Woodbury Leadership Workshop. We're thrilled to have the opportunity to celebrate today the 20th anniversary of our colleague, Kirk Byron Jones' seminal change, change, life-changing book, Rest in the Storm. Andover Newton has offered a Woodbury workshop for more than 50 years. The Woodbury family Faithful members to this day of First Baptist Church in Worcester, Massachusetts, could see even 50 years ago that ministry was coming to involve a lot more knowledge and familiarity with administration and nonprofit management over time. They created a fund at Andover Newton to raise awareness 
about the importance of administrative leadership to ministry. And that fund was used to create educational offerings like the one we're experiencing today. Now, for the first 30 or so years, Andover Newton called this the Woodbury Management Workshop. I've got coffee mugs to prove it. Some of you might as well. Um, when I was given responsibility for the workshop and I joined the faculty in 2005, the planning team, which included Jeff Jones, who is here making sure that we stay honest, uh, Jeff Jones and I were part of a planning team and we decided to change the name of the workshop to the Woodbury Leadership Workshop. We were already starting to sense that the skills and knowledge and attitudes of ministers needed to evolve even further. They had needed to adopt practices of administrative management in say the 50s and 60s and 70s. But as the church began to evolve and the culture around it evolve even faster, they needed to learn more about casting a vision and motivating people, not just managing, but actually leading in new and creative directions. Some of the speakers that we've brought to this campus, Jeff and I both, um, in Jeff's season leading the workshop, have been people who are really at the top of the bestseller lists when it comes to organizational leadership. They included Peter Sange, Walter Fluker, Phyllis Tickle, Ron Heifetz, Tondeika, and most recently, Susan Beaumont, who was our most recent Woodbury uh, Leadership Workshop uh, presenter. In so many ways, therefore, this presentation today represents continuity for Andover Newton, where we've been through a lot of change. But it also represents a marked departure from the ordinary Woodbury Workshop. It's our first Woodbury on Zoom. And it's the first we've offered participants free of charge. That said, we're also honoring our relationships and our heritage and our history. For example, Kirk Jones is an Andover Newton treasure. He and I were colleagues together on the Andover Newton faculty. We shared a hallway in Worcester Hall and well, the first project that we ran together was a preaching contest. Do you remember that, Kirk? That was a riot. Kirk Jones is synonymous with Andover Newton for all the people who are gathered here today. He was, um, from the minute he started teaching, our most sought after professor. I never could offer enough Kirk Jones classes as dean um, to keep uh, seats available. And he's deeply touched the lives of many ministers I've come to call uh, my wisest colleagues. As Andover Newton continues to seek ways to rise to the challenge of educating ministerial leaders, we are now at a new point in our arc. We had the Woodbury Management Workshop, the Woodbury Leadership Workshop, and as our present students know, we now require that students earning an Andover Newton diploma take courses in Yale's School of Management. Now, some might say Yale really needs to get with the program. They still call it a school of management. They should call it a school of leadership. And yet, I'm starting to feel this year like they maybe had a good point. Management remains very important and very difficult. The colleagues with whom I work are becoming expert in HVAC. How do we make our sanctuaries safe as relates to airflow? We didn't offer a class on that at Andover Newton. We definitely didn't offer a class on how to read a room in Zoom and tell when you've been talking too long. Because I don't know that, I'm going to stop talking now and hand over the proverbial Zoom microphone to Tara Humphreys, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you for being part of the Woodbury Workshop this year. And again, Kirk, congratulations on this anniversary edition of your beautiful and meaningful book. Tara, take it away. Good afternoon, 
everybody. I feel like this is old home week uh, and that I am so blessed to be a guest here. Oh my goodness. Um, so it is my privilege this afternoon to introduce you to, although many of you probably know him, the Reverend Dr. Kirk Byron Jones. Hailing from New Orleans, Louisiana, Reverend Dr. Jones is a graduate of Loyola University and Andover Newton Theological School. He holds a doctorate of ministry from Emory University and a PhD from Drew University. A professor for over 30 years, Reverend Dr. Jones served as director of the Kelsey Owens Black Ministries Program and Kelsey Owens Professor at Andover Newton, where he was a beloved gem member of the faculty and has taught and preached at more schools, churches, and conferences than I will even try to count. A preacher since age 12, Reverend Dr. Jones has also served for over 30 years as a pastor and presently serves as the senior pastor of Zion Baptist Church in Lynn, Massachusetts. With what time, I do not know. Reverend Dr. Jones is also a husband, father, grandfather, and friend, and the author of eight books and innumerable articles and other publications for clergy and all people who seek spiritual growth and fulfillment in this changing and challenging world. Speaking, seeking spiritual growth and fulfillment in this changing and challenging world, we, students, pastors, leaders, and lay folk, gather today to celebrate 20 years of rest in the storm, a work no less groundbreaking and prophetic today than it was when it was published now two decades ago. And I will not tell you how old I was, Sarah or Kirk. <laughs> this book, pretty much every line of which is highlighted in my copy, lives on my bedside table. And I pick it up and read it. You know, I read a few pages every time. I need a reminder to keep a savoring pace, which is pretty much every day. <laughs> We are most definitely in the storm, my friends, and so it is my delight to give a joy-filled Andover Newton welcome and an amen to Reverend Dr. Kirk Byron Jones. Oh my. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Oh, this is just as this is this is uh, too too overwhelming right here. Too overwhelming. I'm looking at faces and uh, making connections. I'm seeing uh, former faculty members. I'm seeing beloved former students. I'm seeing uh, folks I taught with. I'm seeing people who knew me when I had an Afro. And let me tell you, I had one. <laughs> I'm seeing members of our clergy team, my son in the ministry, my beloved spouse. I'm seeing some folks here. Boy, it's good to see you. All oh, this love is just good. You could be doing so many other things. So you are blessing my soul. You are blessing my soul just looking at your faces. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andover Newton, Sister Dean. I've called her Sister Dean <laughs> with all the love in the world. Sarah, thank you. Ned, thank you. All of our Andover Newton staff uh, participating on today, helping to make this happen. Thank you so much. I thank you to uh, Judson Press, who took a chance on uh, a first time author 20 years ago. I'd done some work with uh, Judson, but I'd never written a book. And so uh, they took a chance and um, I'm so grateful that they did. And I want to thank, uh, there's one name I, I want to call. <laughs> my wife is on. So I've got to be on my P's and Q's. That's Mary Brown Jones right there. Hey, wave, honey. <laughs> 40 years, 40 years. Um, we've been married this May. And I think my wife, for so many reasons, but uh, Bunny, Bunny, uh, her nickname, Bunny told me, because I had a few books in me. I thought I had a few books in me. And Bunny said, but, but the, the one about self-care is the one you need to write first. I would, t the one about self-care <laughs> is the one you need to write first. And so, honey, I thank you. You were right. 
and it is uh, 20 years, and it's unbelievable. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a few things, and then we're going to uh, respond to some questions. I've, uh, I've <laughs> put, uh, put all the cards on the table. I am a Baptist preacher, and so I've asked uh, my beloved dean to give me the uh, BPA, the Baptist preacher alert, when it's time for me to stop, okay? Uh, chances are I may or may not pay attention, but I will, I will, I will, because your questions and the, your dialogue is something I'm, I'm, I'm very much, much looking forward to as well. Thank you for being here today. Um, I, was, um, I was writing for my life. I was writing for my life. Some of you know the story, you've heard me tell it. I'll tell an abbreviated version right now. I was in uh, my early 30s and uh, pastoring Calvary Baptist Church in Chester, Pennsylvania. Um, trying to be a good husband, father of two then, uh, led an organization called Church Against Narcotics, and then also trying to finish up a PhD. And so uh, my, my, uh, my table, my plate was full. And I know you know something about a full plate. My plate was full. I also, said a yes to preaching uh, revivals, revival invitations. Uh, I love to preach. I think I'm making progress. And so when invitations came, more often than not, uh, Atara, I would say yes, um, even with a full plate. I said yes to a, an invitation to preach. And so I ministered that Sunday, and I uh, traveled to Drew University that Monday, took classes, traveled back to Chester, about a two hour drive, two and a half hour drive, went to West Chester, start preaching the first night of a five night revival for my, my friend, Earl Trent, who's a graduate of Andover Newton. Um, Earl invited me to come, I said, yes. I said, man, it's gonna be a push, but I'll be there, I'll be there. Well, I, um, I got up to preach that night Mia Douglas. <laughs> I got up to preach that night and I was all right for about uh, five minutes. Uh, and about the five minute mark, I stopped. I stopped. I came to a halt. Um, now, I had stopped before, and some of you know what that is. Sometimes you lose your place. <laughs> and I just stopped, and I, I knew I'd learned how to, my, my, my first theological seminary, Mount Hermon Baptist Church in New Orleans, Louisiana, Cousin Florida and, and, and Sister Pearl and, and Deacon Johnson had taught me, boy, when, when, you, when you lose yourself, just steady yourself. But I couldn't do that. I couldn't do it that night. I couldn't do it. I tried, and I couldn't. For a while, it was okay because, you know, in the African-American church, um, people talk back to you. And so in that pause, in that pause moment, I was okay for a while because people were filling in. All right. Mm-hmm. Amen. And, it, and it, got, it got long. The pause was longer. But that was okay because we even have a statement in our dialogical church tradition, even when it's a long pause, we got to cover for that. Take your time, preacher. Well, I still wasn't saying anything. And then I heard what, what you don't want to hear. If you're preaching in an African-American church and you hear this, you need to get in your right lane and take the next exit because you're in trouble. Somebody way in the back yelled out, help him, Lord. <laughs> I never will forget it. I needed help. God knows I needed help. I needed help. Well, look, here's what I did. My recovery was I sat down. <laughs> I sat down. That's the best I could do. I sat down, Muriel Johnson. I sat down. Jeff Jones, I sat down. Cheryl Moore, I sat down. And, and I looked at Earl, and Earl looked at me, and I said to him, I can't go on. I can't go on. And my contribution to that week-long revival was five minutes, five minutes of preaching. I don't know who finished that night. I don't know who finished the rest of the week. I know that I didn't. I was in the throes of something called burnout. Um, 
sleeplessness, panic attacks, nervousness, heart palpitations. Um, it, was, it was a horrible, horrible time. I didn't know what was going on. It had never happened to me before. I've studied it since, but it had never happened to me before. And I was thrown, I was thrown. Um, like never before. <laughs> I was blindsided. You ever been blindsided? I was blindsided from that. I was blindsided. Two, two um, things became my breakthrough. One was a question, a, <laughs> a question asked by a physician. I do not know. I cannot name. That was part of my challenge. I didn't have a, a physician. <laughs> So I went to someone in, in, in Pennsylvania and, and he asked me this strange question while he was checking me over. Reverend, what do you do to relax? <laughs> it sounded as if he was speaking a, a foreign language. But that question, that question stayed me, with me. Someone said, when, when the student is ready, the teacher appears, that question stayed with me. And then this scripture, <laughs> this scripture, Mark 4, 35 through 39. On that day, Mark 4, 35 through 39. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. <laughs> and they woke him up and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up, he woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. I read that scripture one night, Bunny was away for the evening and away with the kids and it was just me in the den with the Bible. I read that scripture. Don't know how I fell on that scripture. Grace. I had preached that text before. I don't know what brought me to it that night. Grace. <laughs> I, I read that scripture and then I prayed a prayer and you know when you're in trouble you don't pray long prayers. I prayed, eloquence goes out the window. I prayed two words, help me, help me. And um, that was a moment. That was a moment that I will remember for all my days. I knew in an instant that I was gonna be all right, Maureen Kamita, I knew I was gonna be all right. Bunny came home and she looked at me. She said, what's wrong with you? I said, nothing now. <laughs> in an instant. But, but then something wonderful happened. The scripture that was a lifeline for me uh, became uh, uh, transformative. It, it began, I stayed with the scripture and the scripture stayed with me. Uh, and, and lessons came and I started writing and the lessons became the heart of rest in the storm. Right there in the text a text that I had preached many times, but these lessons came, these new lessons that transformed my life and saved my life and continues to save my life. And here are the three lessons. And if you've read the book, you know where I'm headed. Three, three essential lessons that just um, grabbed hold to me. And I grabbed hold back and I continue to explore these lessons. And, and I hope that you know, what I got out of them um, is different perhaps than what you got out of them. I hope that those of you who've read the book got just what you needed. I hope if you reread the new book or you read the new book, you'll get something different. Whatever you need and the way you need to hear it, 
I pray that you receive that. That's the other thing I prayed, and this is why I'm full right now, because your faces are a testimony that the prayer was answered. I pray, God, I want to write this book and let me just help one person. <laughs> let me just help one person. And, 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 and more than one person was helped. Here are the lessons. All right, one, and I'll give you them all right now, and then I'll go back and say a few things. Take time for you, Kirk. Take time for you. Take time for you. Watch your pace. God does not need your hurry. God does not need your exhaustion. Watch your pace. And then maybe the most precious of all, learn how to be still. Learn how to be still. Um, those lessons were, were there and, and, and the example was Jesus. <laughs> and the example is Jesus. Take time for you. I never saw Jesus in the back of the boat. I was so used to preaching about Jesus on the bow, quieting the storm. Anita, I never saw him in the back of the boat. You know, and it was, it wasn't that all ministry that needed to happen, happened. It, it, there was still stuff to be done, but he, he hit the off switch. He turned it off and said, I'm done for, I'm done for the moment, I'm done. He, and he knew how to live with the undone. And he got to the back of the boat. Um, I write in, in Rest in the Storm, we cannot be certain of all that Jesus did while he was in the back of the boat, but we know that there were some things he did not do since he was the only one back there. We know that he did not preach to anyone. He did not teach anyone. He did not heal anyone. While Jesus was in the back of the boat, he was not engaged in ministry to others. We must learn to make it to the back of the boat if we are to overcome self-violence in ministry. The back of the boat is a metaphor, a symbol of the necessary break from the activism of life in general and the rigors of ministry in particular. The back of the boat is not a luxury. Time spent in the back of the boat is not optional if our intention is to lead a healthy, balanced, and productive life. It is the back of the boat time, the off time, that makes the bow of the boat time, the on time possible. That changed my life. <laughs> it is changing my life. I learned how to get to the back of the boat. I learned how to say, Adrian, that holy word. I learned how to say no. <laughs> I learned how to say no, thank you. Yeah, and that, and I learned how to, to be, my God, fully present to me. Fully present to me. I, I found Kirk Byron Jones again, apart from the robe, apart from the Reverend Doctor. And, and uh, so the back of the boat, and, 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 and we go on to talk about the importance of leisure. What it means for me might be different for, for what it means for you. For me, it means jazz. <laughs> for me, it means uh, taking a walk, being out in nature, laughing with my wife. Whatever back of the boat, whatever leisure, whatever you do that can, you got to know what fills you and you got to know what drains you. Whatever it is that fills you for you, it's not obligatory. I know when you say, well, my work fills me, but that can't be the only thing that fills you. You need some other things that fills you for you. And so I, I uh, yeah. So that was lesson number one. And here's this other lesson. The lessons kept coming, Jeff. The lessons kept coming, man. Um, they woke him up, the Bible says. And then it says, he woke up. What, now, what, now what, what'd you say now? He, they woke him up. He woke up. Which is it? Well, one way to reconcile that is to say when they woke him up, Jesus went back to sleep. 
it's it, and the lesson is is clear and it's it, you look at the trajectory of his life the expanse of his life jesus lived with with a, a sort of unhurried deliberateness a, a, an unhurried deliberateness he was his urgency was rarely rushed you know he lived with a pace that had waiting in it and patience in it and noticing in it you know and so i i i, I said i want to live at that pace somebody said hurry is of the devil and the correction came no hurry is not of the devil hurry is the devil we miss so much when we're in a hurry and so i i that that thing changed me tom dean <laughs> that changed me I started trying to try to Joe Howard. I started trying to to um, to change, alter my pace so that I wasn't always rushing. I wanted to live with a pace that had time to wonder and to wander and to notice, you know. And that's an, one way to gauge whether or not you're living in a hurry is to say how 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 well are you at noticing. How good are you at noticing? How good are you at listening? Listening with, with compassion and listening with understanding and listening with patience. Oh, so living at a, a sacred pace is the third lesson or the second lesson. And then the third lesson, the main lesson that came for me, excuse me, The third lesson was this whole thing about being still. Jesus told the storm to be still. And the Greek for that, you Bible readers know, what he was telling the storm to muzzle itself, to hold its energy inside of itself. And the storm obeyed. The storm obeyed. And the lesson there was for me to understand and embrace my capacity to be still, to hold my energy within myself. I, I knew, I knew, I knew that folk had talked about stillness, but I really hadn't integrated it into my life. <laughs> and I hadn't read yet Howard Thurman talking about the, the importance of the centering moment. I hadn't read that yet. I hadn't read him talking about stillness, being a cessation of the inner churning. I hadn't read that yet. I hadn't come across Mary Oliver saying that the stillness was not thinking, not remembering, and not wanting hyphenated words. I hadn't run into that yet. And so I had to, I knew the songs. We had the songs. I, I come to the garden alone. There were those songs back there. As a boy preacher, my calling came while sitting Joe under the tree in our yard. So I knew what it was to sit, and, but I had gotten away from it. I had gotten away, away from it, you know, on, on the way to doing ministry. Wayne Muller talks about the possibility of our doing good poorly. We can do good poorly. I, I tried to do, and thank God for grace, I don't know how in the world I got away with trying to do ministry so many years without integrating stillness in my life. Grace, 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 grace. But look, look, before Jesus stopped the storm, he stopped himself. He stopped himself. He was able to call forth the stillness because he had experienced the stillness. <sighs> so look, that, uh, those lessons that I wrote about, they were personal. They were personal. Again, I was writing for my life. And as I spoke with people, my sense was there were others who were experiencing the same sort of uh, challenges. And the prayer was that the lesson, the image of Jesus, you know, it's now this the self-care is not just a matter of, of personal well-being. It is that, but it's about discipleship. It's about doing his ministry his way. 
doing his ministry his way. And so I had to begin to take seriously the call to get to the back of the boat, to turn it off, the call to live at a sacred pace, to, 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 to live with some waiting and some wandering and some wondering. I had to, had to take that seriously. And my God, stillness changed my life. And it's changing my life. Yeah. Ah. And I don't, I'm not telling you something you don't know. There's somebody that you know the power of stillness. You know the power of stillness. All right. Um, there are two new chapters in Rest in the Storm, the 20th anniversary edition. And those two new chapters are um, the result really of, of practicing rest in the storm, two, two, two great benefits. The two new chapters uh, are entitled Cultivating Meaning, Meaningful Friendships. Cultivating Meaningful Friendships, and I see so many wonderful friends on. Um, and then the other chapter is Unleashing, Unleashing Your Dynamic Creativity. Unleashing Your Dynamic Creativity. Um, the friendship, let me just, just say a word about both and, and then we're going to put some pictures up and then, and then I'll be done and I, I look forward to engaging you in conversation. Um, friendship, friendship, friendship. Ah. Sister Dean, Cedric Kirkland Harris, uh, if it wasn't for him, I may not have gone to Andover Newton. And some of you know Cedric, he's with the Lord now. Cedric, I, when I came to seminary, I was just 21 years old. And, um, and I, needed, I needed, God knew that I would need a big brother. And I remember vis visiting Andover Newton one Saturday morning, just looking around and knocked on, I was told to knock on this, this, this door. And this fella, about 6'1", six, 6'2", six, 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 uh, <laughs> would, would, would show me around. Right, Anita? And, and I knocked on the door <laughs> and I see him now in my spirit. He said, you must be Jones. <laughs> and I said, well, you must be Harris. And from that moment on, we called each other by our last names, Jones and, and Harris. And we were, you know, I was the best man at his wedding when he married Linda. Uh, Kirkland Harris, who was also a student at Andover Newton, and he was the best man at our wedding. And we were just, that was my brother. And he told me a few, Rhonda, he told me uh, uh, maybe a year or two after, we'd call on, on and he'd say, Jones, you know, there's something else about that text that you missed. I said, what, what's that, Harris? He said, well, you know, it says that they took Jesus as he was to the back of the boat. They took him as he was to the boat. I said, what are you talking about, Harris? He said, well, they took him as he was, Jones, because he was tired. And sometimes we need people to carry us. <laughs> and then he, he went on, he went on, and he was right. And uh, I, I thank God for him. I thank God for his friendship in the spirit now. And I write a whole, a, a whole chapter about friendship because the truth be told Cedric was really my only real close friend I had some acquaintances but I had neglected and 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 the, st the statistics indicate that clergy um, are susceptible to this not having many friends and so one of the benefits over the the, the, the 20 years is now that I have a, a host of friends I take time for friendship right Muriel <laughs> And, 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 and renewing, renewing friendships, I, you know? Yeah, and Jesus, friendship was important to Jesus. Yeah, they carried him. He needed to be carried. And I talk in the book, I, I, I did a number of entries and headings, and there's a poem, very brief, what if Jesus raised Lazarus simply because he missed him? What if Jesus raised Lazarus because he missed him? The other um, new chapter is about unleashing dynamic creativity. And there, um, 
I mean, look, look at what Jesus did. They thought when they woke him up, it is reasonable to think they thought Jesus was going to talk to them and calm them down. He was good with parables. Maybe Jesus will tell us a story or just his presence with us in this storm, just focusing on his words. Uh, we, our minds will be off the storm and th we'll get through this night. But Jesus, Jesus has had a nap. He doesn't talk to them and calm them down. Don <laughs> Jeffers, <laughs> he talks to the storm <laughs> and calms it down. How innovative, how creative, how dynamic. Wow. In, in a time, in a time when, when we rest, rest, not just for replenishment, yes, but rest of, also for the energy to hold new ideas, to hold creative tension, and rest for the capacity to be transformed over and over and over again. Yeah. So there's a link between rest and innovation, creativity, transformation. There are few things in life more dynamic than a rested soul. Jesus doesn't talk to the disciples and calm them down. He talks to the storm and calms it down. And so that chapter on on creativity talks about how, how, and you know, Jesus, before he left, he winked his eye, before he walked away, he winked and he said, hey, you know what? Greater things shall you do. <laughs> so that there is a, there's this expectation that we follow Jesus in this innovative way, in this creative way. And so we, we explore. I don't know how many answers I offer in those chap chapters, but I'm exploring. I'm exploring, you know? I think life is explore, discover, be transformed, repeat. <laughs> explore, discover, be transformed, repeat. All right, Ned, you got those pictures? I think I, I might be in, there we go. I'm coming in under the wire, Sarah. Here's the first picture I want to, as I close it, as I close, as we say in the preaching world, as I close. Where'd it go, Ned? Is it Sorry up there? That. There we go. There we go. Uh, for this first image, as, as, I, as I close my conversation with you, um, hold on to that image and let it remind you that Life is not just about climbing mountains of achievement. Life is about floating in the waters of contentment. Life is not just about climbing mountains of achievement. Life is about floating in waters of contentment. Aspiration, yes, yes, but always, always from a place of deep peace. Always, always from a place of deep peace. The next one. Ned, hold on to this. I continue to explore this. This is what I've come to learn and appreciate and know. Rest is not optional. Sometimes I do workshops or I coach people and it's as if I can hear them, the doubts and the hesitation. You know, if I, if I take time for me, I'm going to lose my edge. If I take time to rest, if I get to the back of the boat, I hear you, Reverend Jones, but look, I got to keep on keeping on. Well, look, you don't, have, you don't know what an edge is if you don't allow time for margin and rest. Rest leads to peace. Peace leads to clarity. And clarity leads to creativity. Next one, Ned. That's my, that's my friend, Cedric. And this is in the, in the book. Uh, he, did a, he gave me this, uh, this line art. Um, and uh, rest in the storm. <laughs> Cedric Harris is in the corner. I think it's 825, 2001. Mm -hmm. When the book was written, that's what my friend gave me some months after. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is in the back of the boat, the circle, but the friends, the lines, are the three lines of disciples represent the, the, the disciples. You, you see the squiggly, the storm. And so just a reminder that, that um, 
um, self-care is essential to personal and communal well-being. It's not just about, it's not just for you. And so don't feel guilty. One of the most benevolent things you can do is allow yourself space for solitude. It's benevolent. Self-care is essential to personal and communal well-being. If we can be fully present to ourselves, we can be fully and creatively present to others and the world. I believe that with all my heart. The last one. And that's the new, that's the new, this is an announcement. <laughs> this is an announcement. The, the ideas, we left a lot of things on the cutting room floor with, um, with after we finished the chapter on creativity. And I said, you know what, how can I, there was, I keep a creativity journal. And I said, let me, let me put some things in the creativity journal to help folks um, unleash their creativity. And so that's what that is. That, that's going to be released on March 19th. It's a companion volume to uh, Rest in the Storm, the 20th anniversary edition. And it's, it's a book filled with prompts and prayers and affirmations that I have used. Uh, to keep my creativity stirred up uh, and, to, and to create with joy, uh, with freedom, um, and to, to expect it, to expect to be creative, to expect it. Why not? I'm a child of God. You can expect to be creative and innovative. That's our birthright. And... Um, with, with, with rest and love and joy. Hey, every, every storm that you, that you face has to face you. Make sure that every storm that you face, face you, you at your freshest, you at your fullest, and you at your finest. Every storm you face has to face you and the God in you. I think I'll put an amen right there. Amen, sir. Thank you so much. Um, already so wonderful and rich. Uh, so many of the questions we have collected today are they all just seem very personal. Um, so your work is, is invoking a lot of personal reflection and how people are ministering and really just managing our lives. Um, one question is coming from uh, the issue of chapter five's conversation of the sacred pace. And someone wants to know, could you talk a little bit more about the phrase sanctified negligence? Mm. Could you expand more on what that means for you and, and how we discern it? Mm. Some yeses are unholy and some no's are holy. Um, and everybody's different. Uh, I think the, the, the gauge is to know one's, when you slow down and you're able to hear the sound of the genuine inside yourself, as Howard Thurman, that's Howard Thurman's phrase for, for the soul, the sound of the genuine. And I started as I, as I became more alert to the me that was me apart from the trappings of ministry, I began to hear my soul more clearly. And um, I began to be, become more sensitive uh, and to know when I was feeling rushed, to know when my plate was being overloaded, and to take responsibility for, uh, for placing margin, for, for allowing uh, more breathing spaces, that that was a part of my calling to life, is to allow for the margin. And, and, and I don't have to wait until I die to rest in peace. I can rest in peace right now. And so, um, and then Jesus knew how to say no. <laughs> and he knew how to turn it off. And so part of that sanctified negligence is embracing no um, as a part of living a healthy life. Simply because we're invited to do something doesn't mean that we should, especially when we're already drained, uh, when, when our plate is already full. Uh, and, and nobody knows that. Nobody knows what, what's on your schedule. So every time you say yes, you know, only you have the power to say, no, I, I need to put some space in here. Mm -hmm. I need to put some space in here. So to give myself a sanctified negligence is giving myself the space to be. 
to breathe, Mm -hmm. to savor, to relish, to do what I'm not obligated to do. That's what's that's what sacred neg- negligence is. Thank you. That's helpful. Maybe we could drill down even more from that, which is for those of the for those of us who are considering or experiencing bivocational journeys um, in that sacred negligence of no. When you have two jobs, <laughs> how do you balance the yeses and the nos for either? Is there is a discerning a discerning ride on that one? It's a challenge, and those of you are, and I've been there, and in some ways I'm, I'm there. Um, I, let me get very practical. I, I block out my uh, month. I block out my, my week. I block out my days. And so I think schedule, managing the schedule that that's, feels right for you. Everybody's different. But to be able to, like, before, before this day is over, especially before tomorrow, um, uh, by the end of tomorrow, I will have looked at next week. And, and what, where are my, my back of the boat moments? Where's my margin? Where's my jazz? Okay, so that, so that my leisure is as important as my labor. Mm-hmm. Whatever you need to do or can do to make that happen, do so. For some, it's easier. It's, 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 it's easier said than done, but, but taking um, control of my schedule and, and being very intentional about that uh, so that going into a month, I have a sense of where the, where the breathing room is and, and to do that for every day and to do that for every week as best you can and, and you will get better at it. But, but the main thing is for you to appreciate peace yourself, for you to appreciate the margin and, the, and, and to embrace that yourself and to give it a higher valuation. I know easier said than done, but doable, but okay. doable. Thank you for a practical example. That helps me as well. Um, so some of us are looking personally, but also recognizing the constituents that we serve. Um, So there's a two-part question. Um, In addition to purchasing your book for a Bible study or a book group for one's church, um, how do we communicate to the congregation their need for rest as well? Which is to say, how do we frame how we got into this culture of hurry in the first place? and then move towards helping the congregation understand not just my need for sabbatical or a balance of time, but also their need for rest. Well, there are many more resources out there now than were present 20 years ago. So there are books on hurry. Uh, There are books on leisure as it relates to ministry and other, um, other callings in life. So there are many resources out there. In my book, I do talk about uh, those influences to our hurry. Uh, in fact, there's another book that the second book was addicted to hurry. So there's one whole book on, on hurry. So there are sociological uh, influences, there's psychological influences, there's theological influences. There are many reasons why we are overdosing on, on overcommitment and living in a hurry. Uh, some of them are very personal. Some of us are trying to uh, meet the uh, the expectation of, of someone who may be gone on home, mm-hmm. but we're still trying to satisfy them. Uh, and so part of it is, is, is becoming, being very honest about what makes me do what I do. Why am I rushing? Why do I feel like I have to do everything? Mm-hmm. And to begin to, to own some of those um, reasons. Uh, and sometimes we need professional help with that, unraveling that. Um, and then, you know, for me, and then sometimes it's the folk who are, who are encouraging us to slow down. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not always that we've got to um, convince people of the importance of slowing down. They are trying to convince us. For me, in Chester, I had a, a, a dear member uh, who would tell me, you know, Jones, you're good, but you ain't God. <laughs> <laughs> She said, Jones, you're good, but you ain't God. And, and so it was years later when I began to really understand what my member was trying to tell me. So, so know, know that 
in your churches, there are people who, who are already practicing sacred pace, who are already uh, practicing leisure and stillness, and they can help create that, create that culture. But you've got to own it for you first and then model it. Got you. And so those are, that sounds like that's maybe an individual. Um, what if the whole congregation itself needs to go on a uh, Holy Sabbath? And you know, there's some churches that do that. We, there's, there's some churches that have December as a Sabbath. So there are ways of integrating that with small groups, um, even in meetings um, where you allow, you begin with, with stillness and an extended pause uh, during the meeting, allowing for pause, allowing for spaces, and certainly at the end of the meeting, uh, relishing what was what what went on, what transpired. So there, there there are ways to do this administratively. There are ways to do this in our pastoral conversation. You know, uh, you can have a conversation with someone, and it be an unhurried. One of the best things that we can give to anybody is our unhurried attention pure focus, giving people all the time that they need to say whatever it is that they have to say. And so this, what we're talking about can be practiced organizationally in, in meetings, but also it's the way we communicate with each other. And I think we just need to be creative in making ways, small rituals uh, to, live, to live this way. Thank you. I appreciate that. Intentional liturgies that relate to rest. Um, someone has noted your holy laughter. So have I. <laughs> a good friend. Um, deep down belly laughing, which is beautiful. And they're interested in the relationship with that laughter's journey away from the place that you started, which was anxiety and burnout. Um, how did you get from that transformation um, from being anxious and overwhelmed to being able to do a laugh from the bottom of your toe? Oh, well, thank you for saying that. If I move my, uh, I've got pictures of my inspirations on my wall. And one of my inspirations is that great theologian, Jackie Moms Mabley. Mm -hmm. And somebody that knows something about Moms Mabley, one of the great comedians <laughs> of all time. I love the comedians. I have loved laughter since I was small. My dad and my mom loved to laugh. And so for me, it was recovering. When I began to recover Kirk, I began to recover some things that were a part of Kirk from, from early on. And one of the gifts given to me was from my parents, uh, was mirth mm -hmm. and just laughing. And um, I'm grateful because I did lose my laugh there for a while, mm -hmm. but I found it. <laughs> and, and, and there's a sermon, there's a sermon, there are two sermons in the first uh, book, uh, Rest in the Storm, and they've, they're still there. And one is entitled, Let There Be Laughter. Mm -hmm. Let there be laughter. Yeah. Amen. All right. What's up? We have plenty more. So I'm just making everybody got a break. Um, <laughs> so, um, so um, well, here we go. Why do we think God will only be pleased if we are on autopilot working for God? There, there are these um, beliefs that we've sort of ingrained an idle mind is the devil's workshop. Some of them are beloved hymns, spirituals. I keep so busy working from a master. I ain't got time to die. So some of this is a part of what we've sort of taken in. Um, and we have to challenge some of it. Uh, because the fact is this, and I, I believe this, if I never preach another sermon, if I never write another book, God's love for me, you, has nothing to do with what you do. Nothing. Mm -hmm. And for me to really, you know, nothing. <laughs> so God gets a kick out of you for you. Not what you and so what you do is extra. God gets a kick out of your, your hour you know, co-creativity, don't get me wrong, but in terms of the, the, the essence of love essence, that's just there. And that was there before we, we were born, it was there. We were born affirmed. And so we, we can live from affirmation, 
from acceptance and not for affirmation and not for acceptance. That's liberating for me. So, yeah. the, so the ministry, what we do is extra. That's extra. That's, as we say down home in Louisiana, Joe, that's lanyard. That's lanyard. But the core love, the pure love, is just, just love, just love, because God just love. <laughs> that's, just, that's just who God is. Okay. Nothing to do with, with what we do. It's unconditional. My goodness. We can just rest in that for a little while there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is us in this room, in this Zoom. We get, we're getting it. We understand it. We've embraced it. We've been transformed by this testimony. What about the other people? That is to say, um, what experiences have you had with people who are disappointed or angered as a result of our exercising or your exercising this necessary self-care? How have you managed the blowback, if, I, if you will, um, the resistance, if you will, the misunderstanding of your drawing these lines and uh, even practicing this joy? Thank you, Dawn. Um, I, I've learned to live with um, sometimes disappointing others. Live, live with disappointing others, not irresponsibly disappointing others, but sometimes a disappointment happens because I'm trying to honor my life. And that means disappointing others sometimes. Um, and so, and to, to be at home uh, and not need, thank God for the affirmation of others. But if you don't say yes to me, it's okay, because I already have a yes. I already have a yes. That is, is the source of my joy. Now, not having your yes might sting. Mm -hmm. You're being disappointed stings. I don't want to, it stings, but I can make it because there's this fountain inside. Okay. There's this fountain inside. Um, and hopefully you will begin to understand that my no is an act of love. It was not meant to be offensive. But if you never get it, that's on you. <laughs> Some burdens we were never meant to carry in the first place. And one of those burdens is sometimes we carry is that burden of what other folk think about us. And we just need to watch that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So it's more reflection. <laughs> <laughs> Where's it all coming from? Wonderful. Um, we have some others, similarly, I'm included in that group, who are concerned about some other logistics. So I have some friends who say post COVID church has been the most exhausting church they have ever <laughs> been a part of. Mm -hmm. The amount of videos, tapes, and now it's texting all the time, emailing 24 hours a day because people can't physically get to you. Um, what advice might you give to those who feel even more taxed in this supposedly post-pacing stillness time <laughs> of, uh, of ministry? Well, a couple of things. And again, as I say all of this, you need to know, folks, sisters and brothers, I have not, I have not arrived. I'm still on the journey. Uh, but this email piece, I try not to be at the ready for emails all the time. There's a certain period of the day where I respond to email. So a very small, big thing is to not be doing emails throughout the day, but to have a, a space to do emails. Um, I begin the day with uh, a, what I call my morning brew. The best brew in the world is not Starbucks, with all due respect. It's not Dunkin's, with all due respect. It's being still, receiving God's love, embracing myself and all of creation, and welcoming the day as my morning brew. Be still, receive God's love, embrace who you are, others and all of creation in the spirit, and welcome the morning welcome the day or if you're doing brew at some other time welcome the moment because there will never again be a moment like this moment so having 
that at the beginning of the day that sets the thermostat. So everything that you do for that day has to respond to the initial peace that you've experienced. Such a setting, set, somehow, 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 easier said than done, I know, but claim your peace. And then I have what I call peace pockets throughout the day. Right, some people call them breaks. And, uh, I knew I, I was making some headway when earlier on uh, I, was, I was in a peace pocket and Bunny was calling me. My wife was calling me and my child, my, one of the children came down and said, Mama, he's all right, but he's in one of them peace pocket things. <laughs> Get you some peace pockets. And so the peace pocket is about 15 minutes. What you doing, Kurt? Nothing. <laughs> what you doing, Kurt? Listen to Ella. What you doing? Looking out the window at the snow. What you doing? Taking it easy. <laughs> Relaxing my body. Going limp. Sometimes we live so tight. You know, we live so tight. Sometimes we just need to just, you know, just relax. <laughs> um, and so peace pockets, peace pockets, peace pockets. Uh, Awesome. Um, I might get a t-shirt. Yeah. Something. So create create your strategies. Create your little strategies <laughs> that allow you to have something other than busy in your life, something other than hurry in your life. And if you create those strategies slowly but surely, um, you, you will experience the transformation. And you'll get a lot done. Jesus got a whole lot done. Indeed. But on, on peace terms. <laughs> right. Wonderful. Well, now I realize I have to get the second version of your book, but um, <laughs> these last few chapters are extremely intriguing. Um, having been a high school teacher for many years, I know the walk of trying to help young people make friends. Yeah. Um, and it's possible that there are some people who have walked the long journey of ministry and still not sure how to do that. I'm interested in how you branched out or what you did to practice inviting friendship into your life. Wow, wow. That's a great question. And I had fun writing the chapter. Um, understanding the value of friendship and um, what friendship gave, a chance to be completely me uh, and, and be accepted uh, and be affirmed and, and to receive the personhood of another. You know, and so that, 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 and I grew to love that and to want that. And then there's another, there's another friendship that I write about, Don, soul friendship. And so we need friends. And then if you can get one or two soul friends, those soul friends uh, are persons who, who will go with you in, in the deepest valley and, and to the highest mountain. They will own with you your great joys and your great sorrows they will embrace with you your transformation and you will challenge each other to be transformed. Um, and so there's certain, so that friendship, and then Jesus says, behold, I call you friends. And so beginning to, to just, what was not on my radar coming and, and it's just transformed my life. Um, our friends, it's, it's one of the, one of the great, blessings of being alive is being a friend being a friend yeah thank you sir thank you so well much. uh don thank you for your your wonderful uh uh pulling together of the uh queries on the minds of everyone in this um this gathered space i see so much conversation in the chat about this whole idea of, of peace pockets. And am I the only one who I think about, I want a peace pocket with a hot pocket? Because <laughs> doesn't that just sound like the perfect combination to us all? Kirk, thank you so much. In a moment, I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then I'll send us forth with a blessing. Before I do, I want to let you know, I've just posted in the chat a link where you have the opportunity to give Tracy, our seminary administrator. Hi, Tracy. Give a wave. Our seminary administrator, Ned, our associate dean, and me, 
uh, your feedback as we look to the future and planning the workshops of the days to come. So the survey includes um, our hopes that you might give us feedback about today, but also ideas about future topics and speakers you'd like to hear from so that our staff might continue to, uh, to open up portals between Andover Newton and you. Please pray with me. God, you are the river of life. You're the fountain that flows in us. Help us to be like trees planted by streams of water. Help us not to rely on the rains and the weather as much as we rely on you. For you are an eternal source of life and replenishment. And in you and you alone we trust. God, we give you thanks for Kirk Byron Jones. We thank you for the many years that he has considered what it takes to continuously refill our spirit so that we can minister to others. And we thank you, God, that he's still creating, coming up with new perspectives and new chapters and new ways of thinking about rest in the storm. We thank you for his family. We especially thank you for Bunny and give you thanks that she's here with us today. We ask that you continue to bless Pastor Jones's ministry and we give you thanks for his ministry to us today. God, we thank you for Andover Newton, for this school that for 214 years has filled the hearts of those who've heard your call and sent us forth to do your work in the church, in the world, in the way you see fit. We give you thanks, O oh God, for Andover Newton, because at least for today, O oh God, it's what brought us here together. However far apart we may be physically, you've brought us together, God, through this workshop. That is wonderful. It's more than we ever could have imagined in the past and gives us hope and imagination for the future. Thank you, God. Amen. And now hear these words of blessing. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of God Almighty, who created you, redeemed you, and will forever sustain you, be with you now and remain with you all forever. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you, Ned, and amen.